Good morning. We Ukraine, will in the next uh, 90 minutes be speaking about Ukraine, Europe, environment, energy. And we will try to cover how these topics go together. My name is Helena Truchla. I work as analyst in the STEM sociology program. I have three guests. There is Miriam Matsurova, the analyst of Greenpeace, who deals with energy. He studied ecology and environment in Brno and in Prague. and he does project management in energy and environment. Hello, Miriam. Our next guest is online. She's in Poland. This is, uh, our guest is Anna Ackerman. She is the expert in energy and climate policy. She has co-founded the organization EcoAction uh, which is active in Ukraine in the area of environment and since 2022 she's been dealing with the green renewal of post-war Ukraine and she's been working in Geneva and Switzerland. She travels between, uh, between uh, Switzerland and Ukraine. Uh, at the moment, she's in Poland, so she will have to deconnect around noon and then uh, so around 1 p.m. and then uh, she will connect again. So, welcome. And last but not least, Martin Jerusek from Brno. He teaches and researches energy security in Europe and the European context and in relation to the US and Russia. So, hello, Martin. Our today's panel is called, uh, well, uh, deals with the crisis uh, in Europe and Czechia. The most severe crisis at the moment is the energy crisis and the social impact of energy prices to uh, life of people. Another crisis which is happening a little bit geographically further is the war in Ukraine, which is just as important, and the energy war of Moscow against the European countries. We will be speaking about how war affects Ukraine energy system and environment uh, over the last couple of days we've noticed in media that russia has strengthened its attacks of energy infra infrastructure it worsens the life of civil people which is illegal of course and War also harms the environment. There are accidents, explosions. So Anna would uh, speak about this at the beginning. She has prepared a couple of data and slides so that we can see better what has been going on in Ukraine over the last couple of months. Anna, could you please tell us something more? Thank you, everyone. You hear me well. Everything works. Um, I'm glad to be with you and uh, unfortunately not physically today. Uh, I don't know why the, sli ah, the slides are moving already. <laughs> um, so yeah, I will say a few words about the situation in Ukraine in terms of the uh, energy, uh, energy sector damages and how Ukraine has been coping so far. And I think that could be very relevant for actually many countries uh, in Europe and maybe even around the world. Um, this, on the, this very first image, you can actually see um, uh, the, uh, just the plot of land, um, the result of Russian occupation in the north of Ukraine. And uh, I really like this picture because there is so much in it. Uh, on one hand, it shows, um, of course, the level of destruction and, and all of this abandoned equipment. Um, and at the same time that life, life comes back uh, with all this cabbage, the people started growing straight away after Russians left uh, back in spring. 
but there are some things which are invisible and which are for uh, invisible for most of the people, but uh, people who work in the environmental sector, they, they understand. This land, uh, this, this plot of land is in fact contaminated by heavy metals from, uh, from these, uh, you know, tanks that were burning. Um, and in fact, large amounts of territory in Ukraine would be contaminated and would have to be uh, rehabilitated after that, uh, where the fighting is taking place, where explosions took place and so on. Um, so this is how I will move. I will move you through what we kind of went through uh, back at home. So the way everything started for us in, on 24th of February, uh, as Russia started its invasion, we saw oil depots burning all over the country with this massive air pollution uh, and, you know, this, this huge black stacks of smoke uh, going in the air. So, of course, Russia was trying to make sure that Ukraine doesn't have enough oil supplies for, for the army, but also for agriculture activities, for anything. And um, starting from that moment, uh, our organization started monitoring the uh, the effects and environmental impacts also of all this kind of um, damages that Russia was trying to uh, to make. Um, but there is something else in it. So this is uh, a picture from Mariupol. And this kind of has to uh, teach us something. I think the story of Mariupol, um, which is, uh, there is nothing sadder, I think, than this. But uh, Russia attacked very quickly, of course, on 24th, 25th, and it attacked first the electricity, the energy infrastructure of the city. Uh, as, and and they, they were very successful. Uh, so they, they really damaged the um, generation capacities, the transmission networks uh, and everything, because uh, they were not yet, they were not prepared to be protected by, by Ukraine, um, Ukraine's forces. Um, what happens is when you don't have electricity, is that you start you you don't only have you know you cannot you you may think you cannot you know don't have light you cannot charge your phone which is the case, but then you don't have mobile connection. Uh, of course, uh, uh, so basically you have no communication with the outer world, and you have no idea what's happening at all outside. So. People in Mariupol, in fact, after months of occupation, those who were lucky enough to get out of the city, they they were convinced that Kyiv fell already very quickly back in you know February or March, and that all of Ukraine was occupied because I had no access to information. So, so this is one thing that happens when electricity is shut down. Another thing that happens is that, of course, there is no heat because uh, very often you have generation capacities that produce both electricity and heat at the same time. So people were freezing. They have no way to, to prepare their meals and so on. Um, and some, yeah, I mean, we can go into all different kinds of stories, but it was in March when the temperatures were really, really low. So that was the big problem. Another big, huge issue is, of course, that hospitals run on electricity, right? So you have to support livelihoods of people who are, who are sick. So once there is no electricity, all of the critical infrastructure that is meant to support human life, it cannot function. So this is the level and it's relevant for all of us how electricity is actually uh, making us alive. Um, and in Mariupol, everything that happened in Mariupol was a huge disaster because Russia succeeded in destroying the energy um, energy sector first, and they were attacking Ukraine's energy sector from the very beginning. So uh, our organization in Ukraine, Echo Action, started uh, making a map of all the different types of uh, damages uh, on energy infrastructure, but also of all the other types of environmental damages that could be caused by all of these explosions and, 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 and fighting. You could access this map now. It's uh, now it's been run by our volunteers uh, and updated constantly, um, and um, it's it's on the on the website. Um, but um, we of course were really back then we were naive because we thought okay we could take all of that as it's the war crimes to the international courts you know and and ask Russia to pay for that. But in fact it appeared to be very complicated to do that internationally. Uh, but we hope uh, maybe we, Russia could pay at least with the frozen assets. Um, 
because these kind of things are still underdeveloped in the international community of how you actually can put a price tag on all of those damages. So we'll see how we can proceed with that. Um, then another thing that's been happening is, uh, so now I will give you a few examples from different sector, energy sectors. So back in March, Russia's, Russians occupied uh, Chernobyl power plant. And then they occupied also Europe's largest nuclear power plant uh, in uh, the city of Enervodar, uh, which is called Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. And they, so Chernobyl area was um, liberated, uh, just like uh, the, all of the regions in the north of the country. Um, of course, like the, uh, the workers of the Chernobyl plant were kept hostage for, for um, many days and so on, but luckily, um, you know, that area, the area is fine. And Russia did many stupid things like digging trenches in Chernobyl area and doing really strange things as if they had no idea. And seemingly they didn't have idea where they actually were. Um, but then with the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, and this is the picture from Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. This, I think, is also um, is a case where international response is kind of zero. So Russia... Uh, is the first country in the world which basically uh, is um, became a nuclear terrorist state. So the workers of Russians, uh, Russia's uh, nuclear energy, energy company, Osatom, are in this power plant. The army is occupying the power plant, but there is no way for now for the international community, or rather there is no will maybe to do anything about that. There is some talks and so on, but they continue for very long. And of course, uh, you know, we started thinking of what it actually means that there would be an explosion. So there, I probably also saw this in the news, you know, where the radioactive cloud would go. So there were lots of modeling made and so on. And this is not the kind of things we, we want to be living in, but it is because Russia is, uh, again, it still occupies uh, the lar largest power plant, nuclear power plant in Europe. Um, and we cannot do anything for the moment. And there is no sanctions also or anything. Another thing that Russia has just uh, uh, another blackmailing, which they come up with every single week. There is new type of blackmailing. Now, uh, there was the Kachovka dam explosion uh, at the hydro power plant. So they said, we will explode the dam, you know, which would have flood. Uh, we don't know yet whom they wanted to flood because, in fact, it would have affected their own military and soldiers. But uh, in any case, this is this is their way the Russia acts to um, to do everything basically to have Ukraine uh, negotiating, um, probably. Uh, it's, it's, it, this is their main aim with this. Um, so this is the results of, of, the, of Russia's attacks on energy infrastructure from the beginning of the invasion, from February to today. And you can see that in October, we had 50 uh, new um, attacks um, on the infrastructure. So in comparison for the beginning of the invasion, of course, it's it's huge. Um, so at the moment, more than 30% of our energy infrastructure was affected. Um, and of course, that puts into, into danger the livelihood of people all over the country because we are living in the uh, interconnected energy system. Uh, so when something fails, some capacities fail in one part of the country, others start failing too. And this is something, that, this is why Ukraine has been asking um, the countries and, and the European countries for uh, air defense systems to protect our energy infrastructure. Why? Because once electricity is shut down around the country, there will be another humanitarian disaster and there will be another wave of refugees again toward Czech Republic, Poland, and everywhere. We don't want this. And, and in fact, people want to be coming back home. You know, they it's not like they want to be living somewhere else. But this is our reality at the moment. Um, and uh, how the way the way Ukrainians are preparing to survive this winter is by buying diesel generators, um, batteries, and different um, equipment to make sure if this. And actually, electricity cut started. So I I was in Kiev just like a, a day ago. And in the office, there are electricity cuts already now and then because the electricity system has to be balanced all the time. Um, so people are buying everything they could hit their, themselves with and also the way like to, to actually keep working somehow. So different storages, uh, batteries, 
and um, and generators of different sorts of different scales, which are being which are actually lacking, and then the government is also trying to organize some stuff there. Um, but a few words, as we are actually at the inspiration forum, I thought I should mention also just a few things about uh, what worked. On this picture, you can see one of Ukraine's solar power plants. Um, in fact, again. Um, like 90% of our wind capacities, which are in the south of the country, so wind energy, it, they're under occupation. And also uh, about 50% of all solar capacities are also under occupation. But those at least to which we have access, we saw the effects. Um, and so you can see this power plant that, you know, the picture is crazy, right? There is the, There was this rocket flying in it and there is this big hole in the ground from the rocket attack. But in fact, uh, you can very quickly, in just a matter of a few weeks, connect again all of the solar panels which are working, operating, and the, the station will keep functioning. Unlike any power plant, so a big centralized uh, thermal power station at any station, if it's under the attack, to repair it, it would take a year or two years, so maybe it's actually repairable. So renewables in this, in this way are much more resilient. And, uh, and in smaller scale, it's even more interesting. So we have cases where, first of all, uh, uh, when you have a solar panel and, and the storage, uh, there is this whole buzz now with Elon Musk and his Starlinks. But in fact, uh, Ukraine was also getting some support uh, with the, how it's called, Tesla's uh, wall, I think, power wall, right? So if you have a solar panel installed on a hospital and the power wall or any kind of storage, in fact, um, you, you you would have the hospital running if there is you know big black uh, blackouts. And one more example from a city which which is very close to Chernobyl, where most of the Chernobyl workers live. Uh, it's called Slavutich. There is a, a solar energy cooperative on on the it's on the um, right uh, right image. So on the schools and administrative buildings there are solar panels. And uh, when the city was under occupation, they had no electricity. Um, and uh, but they still could use some of those um, some of the production from these solar panels to charge their phones and in fact to to send information about themselves to their you know relatives and to say hey I'm alive what's going on and they are like yeah we are holding it you know Kiev is still running and like in Mariupol again um, so just to end up here so the the, the main message is um, the main I, I think. Uh, thing that we learned now is how to make energy systems more resilient. And it seems that now it will be a lot about own energy production. So how to make sure that we are not dependent from, uh, of course, we're talking about, we were talking about attacks, you know, and so on on energy infrastructure, which actually can happen now with the, in the era of drones. Uh, and the, um, in, uh, in any case, we have to protect our energy infrastructure, but how to make it actually resilient and how to make sure that we support our lives well and the answer is uh, decentralized, or well, at least uh, to an extent, of course, you can decentralize everything, but heat pumps, solar panels, wind turbines, which are decentralized, they still go together in one network, but it's important to be uh, thinking in that direction. And also things which have never been popular in policy, but energy efficiency, uh, our buildings have to don't have to be dependent on gas. You know, you have to think about how to actually make them independent from especially from Russian gas but actually in fact from any you know why important if you could produce yourself uh, electricity energy and then consume it on the spot um, this is what we are trying now to think of how do we rebuild Ukraine in that direction how do we have newest standards for our buildings that would be well, would provide energy security and resilience to all the population uh, in this in this situation uh, that's it from me uh, for now Thank you. Thank you very much. I think this is extremely interesting because we can see that there are some thoughts, some concepts, but in some way they are all similar because in the Czech Republic as well, uh, we have a strong narrative of that the renewables are very good not only in association with the climate crisis but also uh, in the question of energy efficiency and financial efficiency. Martin, I would like to 
turn to you now about something that Anna already said. She shortly mentioned this. I would like you to uh, quickly evaluate the response of Europe F and of the Western society uh, as for the attacks on Ukraine. I would like to know what your thoughts are on the ways that Europe and the Western society can use to help Ukraine, but maybe also what lessons we learned from this. Was this an eye-opener in some way? And what do we need to work on? Thank you. I hope I am heard. I personally think that it is exactly as you said. I think we, as Europe, managed to switch the narrative a bit and switch the public debate a bit, and that nowadays we are quite aware of the fact that the renewables and energy transition are something that can not only be done in ideal positive conditions, but that is, on the other hand, something that we need to do now and there is no way of going back to fossil fuels. For example, if we take a look at Germany, they said that they will start the operations in some coal uh, power plants again. But I think that this is an example which shows us that we understood that renewables are way to more secure and safe energy policy. I think our dependence on fossil fuels is quite dangerous because we are getting the majority of our fossil fuels from Russia. So I think that energy transition can help us to making Europe more energetically secure. And this is the good news, because till February 2022, there was a big gap between the understanding of energy security in the West of Europe and in the Central or Eastern Europe. In West, it was understood as a way of making the market more efficient. There they concentrated a lot on distribution of commodities, but in the Eastern Europe, the narrative was more like, well, we think that the energy security has a lot to do with our history. We had problems in the past with energy being strictly bound to uh, geopolitics. So this is a big difference in thinking in West and in the East. And I think that in the West, they also understood this, and we understood in the East, that energy transition is also a way to safer and more secure energy policy. An example of this is, for example, the initiative of the European Commission, for example, in May of this year, when they say that they want to become independent uh, of the Russian gas, which is a way to safer and more secure Europe. And once again, to Ukraine, I think that the crisis will actually accelerate what has been happening since 2014, where we started changing the way we are getting our gas and the sources where we are getting our gas from. Quite often, people ask, where is Ukraine getting their gas from? People say they get it from Russia, but that's not true. That's not happening anymore. They are getting their gas from the West, actually. But I think that the crisis will definitely accelerate what we've been doing in terms of Ukraine and energy efficiencies till now, but it will become much more quicker because this will definitely show Ukraine that this is the way to go and it will provide the sources for Ukraine to renew. Maybe one more point. Like two weeks ago, I actually studied the gas pipeline which goes through Ukraine to the Europe, and I was quite surprised to learn that there is still gas in this pipeline coming to Europe. Why do you think that this pipeline has not been destroyed yet? What's the logic in this? Of course, as you said, the gas is still running through this pipeline, but we will see what will happen in future, because Russia is acting very illogically, and you can never know what they will do next. So, in this sense, it is only logical that 
Russia would attack this pipeline and the fact that the pipeline is still on and running is, in my opinion, a coincidence maybe, and also the coincidence of the fact that there hasn't been an attack yet. But this is something we cannot really rely on, I think, and we should really work on our energy independence um, in terms of our gas supplies. Great. I think that now it is important to distinguish between two times period how to solve the energy supplies this winter, what to do next winter, and what to do with the energy policy next in Europe as such. Now, days the Europe is trying to get liquid gas as fast as possible, for example, from Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Azerbaijan. I think there are discussions going on with these states as potential providers. There is also the question of nuclear fuels that we've been getting from Russia. So how would you evaluate these risks of being dependent on one provider? Because uh, now we are, or we were, dependent on one provider, but this can change quickly and we can become dependent on many other providers. Do you think that there is a future in uh, cooperation with countries like Qatar, which is not a democratic state, really? Am I being heard? Yes, okay. I actually wanted to comment on one thing. Thanks to the crisis in Ukraine, we understood how big our dependence on fossil fuels is. Since the beginning of the war, we've managed to decrease our dependence by 30 percent, which is great. But we, of course, see that in terms of the next winter, we have to take measures to ensure that we have enough heat for the households and that we will survive. But it is extremely important not to get stuck and not to repeat the same mistakes as to say. So this is to be seen as a short-term solution. And we have to find another one, as, for example, the renewables, as was mentioned. We've already started talking about the potential energy cuts. So I think what is the most important thing is to focus on the renewables right now. Up to 84, 87% of people in the European society know that it is important to focus exactly on that, on the renewables, for example, on solar energy, on winter energy, and see the potential substitution of Russian fossil fuels in that. In Ukraine, the situation is similar. The Ukraine was awarded a candidate country status within the European Union. And this is actually a symbol. It has a symbolic meaning of Ukraine be becoming a part of the European family. So it's important to invest in the renewables in the Ukraine as well. So we need to really empower people who will themselves distribute the potential power and they will have control over this process as well. So we can see many initiatives going on in the European Union with uh, their focus being the renewables and this should happen also in Ukraine. This would help us to achieve uh, our goal of decarbonization till 2050 because we can see that that we as the European countries are trying, but it is not enough still. Anna, you, um, our colleague now mentioned the candidate status for Ukraine. I know that this was an important step, however symbolic in this point of time. However, there has been a new initiative, European community, European energetic community, which gives a space for closer cooperation between the European countries and Ukraine. When we focus on the energy sector, I know that this new community, this new association is often discussed, and it is said that the energy policy is one of the sectors where there could be a very where there could be very tangible results of this cooperation. So do you think there are any possibilities for cooperation in this energy sector? Um, I think uh, it actually you can even take it larger because the uh, the cooperation in the energy sector um, and Ukraine's role in decarbonization of Europe and achieving the goal, the main goal of the EU Green Deal, which is 
uh, climate neutral continent by 2050. And we hope that the continent also includes Ukraine, right? <laughs> uh, it, in there, Ukraine would have to play a very important role. And uh, I sincerely believe that uh, it could. Uh, in fact, Ukraine was already uh, producing solar panels. Um, of course, not yet at all of the stages, but we had own production of solar panels. We had own production of parts of wind turbines, for example. Um, also in energy efficiency, insulation materials, and so on. Um, now there will be a big demand, uh, and it will be growing, I think, probably exponentially for heat pumps uh, all over Europe, replacing gas heating with heat pumps. Uh, and uh, perhaps, you know, Ukraine could, be could become a hub uh, of uh, heat pumps production for Europe. We have capacities, uh, we, have, uh, uh, we have engineers, um, so I think the, the, all of these discussions, and this is something I hope for for now, because uh, I don't hear it that much yet. So what is the role of Ukraine in, in uh, decarbonization of Europe? Um, and again, the role could be, could be very large. What we hear, though, um, is two things, um, that Ukraine could be a producer of green hydrogen. And Germany seems to be very interested in this. Um, I'm partially skeptical because, uh, in, and I hope it will not turn. So what is green hydrogen, right? So the, the idea is that hydrogen would replace gas uh, for, especially for interest, the industries that could be important because not all the industries could decarbonize easy. Uh, but to produce green hydrogen, you need huge renewable capacities like solar and renewables. You need water and out of those ingredients, electricity, green electricity and water, you produce green hydrogen. Um, so if imagining that there will be foreign investors, European investors coming to Ukraine, building big solar panels, uh, so big solar stations, wind stations, and then uh, producing hydrogen on the spot and exporting everything to the EU, uh, that I think would be a bit unfair because there will be no ownership um, of, of the results. And, and the, the same goes, then now there is also discussions about Ukraine playing, playing a role as a producer of critical raw materials, which are needed for energy transition. So that could also be the thing. So with the, within, within the candidate status or not, we also have to now think about how do we build Ukraine and what would be the role of Ukraine in the future uh, of, of the EU. And of course, and this is, this is already communicated and, and I'm very glad it is. So uh, the European Commission says, Ukraine's reconstruction would go in line with the integration to the EU. And this is the way it should be in all the sectors. Um, so we exp we will be working on that also from our side. Of course, all of the NGOs will do everything so that it would be possible. Uh, and uh, because this is, this is our ultimate goal that Ukraine uh, becomes uh, a partner and a member state in the EU um, in I, I don't know when, but we hope as soon as possible. Thank you. Interesting. Could you maybe give some examples of sources that Ukraine is now getting its energy from, so we can compare it to the situation in the Czech Republic a bit? Um, so, pre uh, pre Russian invasion. 50% of electricity was produced from nuclear sector in Ukraine, uh, nuclear, nuclear energy. Um, we have four functioning nuclear power plants. Um, around um, a quarter uh, from, 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 from coal, uh, and then uh, 10, around 10% hydro, and then everything else renewables. And the role of renewables uh, has been growing steadily. Uh, heating, uh, so that's mostly provided by gas. There is some biomass too, but it's mostly gas. Um, at the moment, uh, Russia is targeting mostly thermal power plants, which are run on coal or on gas. Nuclear power plants are running because, of course, Russia would not attack directly nuclear, nuclear power plants. Um, hopefully they wouldn't. But they uh, try to destroy transmission networks, so it reduces capacity at times of new, for nuclear power plants. So we, I cannot give you exactly the numbers at the moment, how it looks like, but uh, the, the energy mix um, is uh, stayed the same, it's just the capacity reduced. So it's nuclear, then it's coal and gas, and then some renewables which are still running, and of course hydro. Uh, this is the way it is at the moment. 
Martine, s ohledem na to, uh, Ana se věnuje ve své práci Martin, uh, plánování té Anna zelené has been uh, with the energy transition, energy reconstruction of post-war Ukraine. So uh, what do you think are the opportunities for Czechia or for the European Union? I am thinking about the opportunities and the time when this will already be possible if I'm being optimistic. So is there some relation between the Czech energy mix and the opportunities in Ukraine. I think that this is a very important thing. It seems it is just about energy, but it's about the overall reconstruction, renewal of Ukraine. I would like to step aside from the, the role of an analyst. But what is very interesting for me is that Ukraine is right now creating its national story because the people are doing their best and this will influence the capacity of Ukraine to renew uh, itself. And I think that energy will be a big part of that because the war is being fought in a time of a big geopolitical difference. There is an old superpower, a fading superpower that's trying to get something. And it is happening at the same moment as a moment of an energy transition, which is being accelerated by this, even though Ukraine is suffering terrible things at the moment. It has an opportunity in this to base its renewal on something that would be difficult for it to get otherwise, that other countries will have to, to try hard to do, to do this. And Ukraine will be already creating its system based on the requirements of the energy transition. And I think that this is an opportunity for the cooperation between Europe and Ukraine. Regarding the green hydrogen, I am not sure how much the infrastructure which is already there will uh, can be used to transmit hydrogen because the molecule of hydrogen is very small and it might leave the infrastructure I am getting maybe too technical so just to sum up just to, to close it I think that this is a big opportunity for Czech companies if I'm being selfish but the energy transition will need a lot of investment, massive investment into infrastructure. The existing infrastructure for gas will probably be used for the new resources, even though it is not meant for that. We will need more flexible infrastructure. We will need to create a better network for nuclear power. We need to abandon the system where one place is a producer and other places are the users and the system goes only one way. We will need to create batteries and two-way systems where energy will be able to flow from one place to another and the other way. And if we include Ukraine in this new network, the network will be way more stronger. I hope I am answering a question, but I think this will be one of the assets. The more robust the network is, the more stable it will be. It will be able to use resources from all other places in Europe. The bigger the network grows, the less it will be affected by, for example, uh, there will be no win at some point. So, uh, if we cooperate more with Ukraine, it will create more security for Europe as well. So, uh, I think that, yes. 
I would just like to deepen the question a little bit. So how can Czechia or Europe help Ukraine? We have heard at the beginning that the impact was not only in the area of energy, not just blackouts, but there is also a huge impact on environment. There are explosions, there is pollution. So in what way we can help in uh, this area? So I would just like to add that Ukrainians are creating their history this is already the eight months of the conflict and it is already important to have a plan to build a specific future. At some point the war will end. Not just the infrastructure is destroyed, also social infrastructure and houses are destroyed. So it is important for Ukraine to have a vision because soon people from the exile will come back home and they need to have a vision what Ukraine will look like after the reconstruction. We need the renewal to be green. The question of decarbonization does not touch just the energy system, but there is also a huge impact on biodiversity and environment because forests and soil get uh, the pollution, it also absorbs the carbon. So we need Ukraine to contribute to its positive vision also together with the European transformation transition. So Ukraine will have to join the green wave of Green Deal. Concerning the environmental impact, we have seen a couple of pictures from Anna. There are 40% of protected environmental areas that are affected by war. There is probably no protection at the moment. So this is another thing that Ukrainian people can do. They can also protect their environment. There are some ecosystems that will have to be completely reconstructed, that will have to start anew. And this is actually a good thing for some ecosystems, for some places. Are there some Czech organizations that are active in this? I am not sure at the moment, but within Greenpeace there is still a branch in Ukraine where there are two ecologists. Their main goal is to set a vision of green Ukraine after the renewal. They cooperate with eco-action on the local level in Ukraine. Now, I will see it from the other perspective. I will mention one topic that steers the discussion in Europe, and this is nuclear energy. Uh, on the one hand, we've seen in the pictures from Ukraine that a nuclear power plant could be a threat in wrong hands for example, when it's being attacked. But on the other hand, if we get the nuclear fuel from somewhere else than Russia, it is maybe cheap for the existing nuclear power plants. In Czechia, it is uh, actually a cheap source of energy. So what is your opinion about the nuclear energy, about the impulses that we are getting uh, from the war? Is it a way to change our mind about nuclear energy? The war has shown that nuclear plants are a centralized resource which is dangerous because there is an impact to health of people and uh, the countryside as well. Concerning new nuclear reactors, we are thinking about uh, construction of these reactors in Ukraine, but it is not a quick decision because it, ca it takes some 10 or 15 years to create a nuclear reactor. But at the moment we need a short-term 
solution. So at the moment, it is fine to use the reactors that we have, but in the future, it is not economically uh, good because it is a big investment. And in terms of short-term decisions, yes, it is a good thing, but in the future, we will have to invest into renewables, which are a decentralized resource and that are uh, among the hands of people. Jaderná energetika má svoje, má svoje uh, proti, uh, zejména tedy v tom, že se jedná o centralizovanou uh, výrobu elektrické energie a ve chvíli ta země na ní z velké části závislá, tak v případě výpadku může mít velký problém. Uh, zdravím Francii tímto, uh, která, která tento rok si zažívá, co to znamená, když máte málo diverzifikované energetické portfolio, kdy vlastně vlivem, uh, řekněme, zanedbané údržby, ale na, těch nejaderné, na té nejaderné části uh, uh, odstavil vlastně dvě třetiny své, své jaderné kapacity, uh, při, k čemuž se přidalo ještě období sucha a tak dále, uh, což z, z, z čistého vývozce elektrické energie udělalo čistého dovozce. Což je jeden z těch důvodů, proč třeba teď, proč teď zrovna platíme uh, vysokou cenu za elektřinu, protože, protože uh, museli naskočit ty plynové elektrárny a Francie vlastně dováží elektřinu teďka. Já to jsem trochu odbočil. Uh, d, uh, Chtěl bych k tomu dodat to, že my, já pořád pracuji s těma nějakýma historickýma zlomama, protože teď se skutečně nacházíme jako v období, kde se spousta věcí mění a reformátuje a jedna z nich, byť, byť menší než, než ty velké geopolitické zlomy a energetické, je třeba i to, jakým způsobem vnímáme jaderné zdroje a jejich výstavbu. Ty jaderné zdroje v postupem času přestali investorům dávat dost smysl, protože elektri cena elektrické energie spadla nízko, zatímco náklady na výstavbu jaderných zdrojů vystoupaly vysoko i vlivem uh, takových událostí, jako třeba byla v Fukushima a podobně. Uh, uh, což uh, bralo vlastně těm investorům možnost si spočítat nebo mít nějakou rozumnou návratnost té investice a proto vlastně nikdo v Evropě téměř nebo na světě výstavba nových jaderných reaktorů šla dolů. Stavili se v podstatě jenom tam, kde do ní, do té výstavby byl někdo ochoten nalít obrovské peníze a byl schopen na to na sebe vzít to riziko, což vlastně nezřídka nebo ve velké míře byly centralizovány dost často autoritářské, autoritářské země. Co teďka vidíme v Evropě je to, že se začíná vlastně uvažovat trochu that we are thinking differently about the energy sector. We are thinking that the market is sending us energy signals, but we are starting to understand that this is not the best environment, not best indicator, which shows us what is strategic decision and what is not. Market can be very deceiving because it shows you what the situation is in very moment, but it doesn't show you how the situation will evolve. So if you get a source which is built, as it was said here, for 10 or 15 years, and then it can be in operation for next 50 years, but you still have to invest in it. So we are talking about four five, six different generations of people who will have to take care of this source of energy, it is a problem. Because you know what the price is now, but you have no idea what it will be in a month, in two months, in five months. So, in one point, you may discover that you don't have enough capacity and that you would need more or less. So, the discussion is actually changing and people are thinking if some parts of the energy sector shouldn't be uh, taken over by the state and if these risks shouldn't be covered by the state. This is a discussion which is going on and which should be going on, in my opinion. And, of course, parallelly to that, we have the discussion about the nuclear sources which can help with the situation a bit. So I think we cannot close our eyes on the sector of nuclear energy because it has also its advantages and now the discussion is coming back to what was problem in the past. So it's 
necessary to see the context. Anna, would you like to react maybe about this discussion uh, about nuclear energy? If you want, you can. But I have another question which I would like to add concerning how the public understands the green transition, because when we discuss this topic in the Czech Republic, we have already overcome uh, people saying that the climate crisis is not real, that it is not human-made, etc. People know that this is a problem and that we need to do something about it. But once we start to talk about um, significant measures for decarbonization, for example, once the discussions become more real, people start to panic because they are afraid of this influencing their life, about their living conditions decreasing because of that. So what's the situation in Ukraine? What was it like before the war, maybe? Can you maybe tell us a bit more about this discussion? Uh, sure. So I will maybe add from, from uh, on the nuclear just one little bit that is, I think, is important for me. And that reflects what uh, the other speakers were saying, that when you do these investments now, which is the uh, a longer term investment into for the energy transition, um, in case of nuclear energy, it's a long term project for 10, 15 years. And any of that sort of project would be in competition with any other ones that could be other sources of clean energy uh, or not clean, you know. Um, so you either invest uh, in one or the other. Of course, you can be saying, oh, we'll be doing both at the same time. But unfortunately, uh, life is so that that's not how uh, usually things happen. Um, and uh, for actually in terms of uh, energy transition in Ukraine and for uh, the transition for reconstruction, at the moment, the, how the situation looks like is that the government in the energy sector, at least, um, they don't prioritize really. And as Ukraine, and as I was already mentioning before, Ukraine has all of the different sources of energy production. So starting from nuclear to coal and to gas and to hydro and to renewable. So uh, a bit of everything. Um, this is exactly what you see in the um, in the national uh, reconstruction plan, which is now a draft, but uh, a very big draft. In fact, uh, lots of people worked on it. But on the other niche energy sector, um, basically the government is saying we want investments into everything, into nuclear and into hydrogen and into and probably less into coal. We understand that coal is probably already gone. Uh, the era of, of coal is gone. But gas, also oil and gas, and also and also renewables, a bit of everything. Uh, just trying, uh, and they're in a position when any investments would be great in order to support uh, the recovery of the economy. Uh, and also because all of these sectors already exist in Ukraine, so there is a lobby from all of those sectors that exists. Um, and this was the case before, and this is still the case now. Um, so the strategy is not really a strategy. It's more its more like a shopping list or wish list, let's say, not a shopping, but a wish list of all of the different things. But as I mentioned, I mentioned in the beginning, uh, usually still one, invest, one sort of investment would be in competition with other sort of investments. And Ukraine needs... Um, and Iveta, I think you mentioned this also that Ukrainian need this vision of, of this uh, of this reconstruction, right? Uh, what is the ultimate final goal? Uh, how our energy sector, but also how our economy would look like in 2050, for example. Where are we moving, and towards what we are reconstructing? And uh, we are definitely moving uh, toward the EU integration. That's uh, not even you know there is no discourse about that. That's 100 percent true. But, you know, when you go into different sectors and, and on all of this larger picture, um, there is still not many discussions even about that. We are trying to, uh, to stimulate them, but uh, for now there is not many. So, and regarding of the way that people see the, uh, the, uh, the energy transition, um, and I, I guess that's, uh, that would be the case for many countries. Of course, some are much more, some countries are much more progressive the way the popula population's understanding of, of climate uh, challenge and cl climate change and how to deal with that is uh, uh, in some countries it's much more present. In Ukraine, less. But um, what is important for people is, of course, and we see this now during the energy crisis, how much they're actually paying every day for, for energy they consume, right? 
uh, how to survive. For some, it's the question of how to survive, but for, for others, it's how to live better. And um, so for Ukrainians, uh, the, the questions of like climate and environment, they were never number one, and especially now, they would not be number one, of course. The question, the, the main questions are security. Um, but then that's why I mentioned in my short presentation, the question of resilience. So many saw, thanks to these horrible events, but many saw actually what it actually means um, this bit like this with the solar panels that could be producing some energy on the spot, how that actually could play, play a role. So, so for some people, the perception may be changing of what it actually means, what security actually means. And to add on top of that, um, we, we've been in our work, uh, although we were working on, 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 on advancing climate policies in Ukraine, we, we thought number one thing to do would be energy efficiency, to decrease consumption of you know, gas uh, in our homes means to, and also means um, to, for people to live better in better buildings. This is some, some of the countries actually like Czech Republic and Poland, they, they, they really progressed a lot, but I'm sure there is still a lot uh, that could be done. And I'm sure that the speakers have something to say about that. But when you work on energy efficiency, uh, when you insulate homes, but when you also make homes, again, energy independent, it actually makes people's lives better. And uh, we should really now, I think, in this, um, yeah, in, in current circumstances, maybe we don't even need to be talking that much about climate. For some, it still remains important, um, climate policies and so on, but about security and resilience and show them what it actually means. And, and people would, I think, perceive that. And of course, um, uh, also um, the, we, we, we could be, you know, there is a lot of conversation about replacing sources of energy with one with the other, uh, how to get rid of Russian fossil fuels, but to get fossils from other countries, or okay, we're gonna get renewables to produce electricity, but we have to be thinking of people who live in their buildings and they could be consuming much less. What could we do for them to pay less now? And the answer is, you know, smart meters and all of the different measures to reduce consumption, but still keep lives of people running uh, and make them feel feel well, you know. So, um, so that's why it's as important to be thinking on the pro energy production side, but also on the consumption side and how to help uh, the population. Thank you very much. If I am not mistaken, Anna, you need to deconnect now for a moment. Am I right? Okay, great. So, uh, we will speak about the Czech situation for a moment, and then we will welcome you back. And the last 20 to 25 minutes will be open for any questions. So, there will be room for them. I would like to speak more about the economic situation that Anna has mentioned. The green transition of all sectors of human life will have an even impact on different parts of the society. In the end, the society will probably benefit from that. It will provide for our competitiveness in the future. But we can expect that some parts of the society will not see the benefits or not at the moment, or it will be difficult for them. So I would like to know, if we are speaking about the transition in Czechia, what are the attributes of this transition for it to be able to keep all people on board, uh, such as people in coal regions, people, uh, factory workers that work in uh, diesel car factories. So, Miriam, what's your idea about this? So, regarding decarbonization, it needs to be just. That's why we are mentioning just transition. You've mentioned coal region workers. They need to be retrained. And I think that in all policies, these aspects are kept in mind. So at 
any moment there is a policy which is adopted, these people are in the center of the transition. So people and nature are the central parts of the transition. We already see that coal is not a way to go. Coal is ending already. So we need to retrain people. Their retraining should be funded by the government. And there are many NGOs in Czechia that try to help these people that work on the local level and try to ensure their needs. Martin, do you believe the transition will be just in Czechia? This is a great question. This is a question for us. I mean Czechia in general, because the Czech history of being able to use funds from the European Union is not very good. The just transition, transition specifically is the very name of one of these funds. In the last couple of years, if you see how money were from funds were distributed, for example, after the COVID pandemic, and if you look directly at the chapter of energy, the distribution of the sources is not even at all. Very often it happens that the money is given to big energy companies. They are not distributed and decentralized enough for, for example, the decentralized energy that will be very important in the transition. Because one of the trends is decentralization of energy production. To put it easy, you can put solar panels on your roof or you can have a battery at home and when you don't need it, you will put energy to the network and get money for that. So all these things should be part of the energy transition. And this money should be also given to the affected regions, the coal regions. There will be money for that, but we need to distribute them well. This is not the only thing that needs to be done. It is not that if we distribute money correctly, everything will be okay. But it is one of the things that we need to do. This is one of the simplest measures that needs to be done. So this is the first step, efficient governance, efficient administration of the resources. I mean all kinds of resources. We still tend to, uh, this is just my idea, but we tend to see what other people set for us, but we first need to gov govern and organize what we already have. Miriam, do you want to react? I would just like to contribute, to uh, say one thing. I think that policies keep vulnerable people in mind, but not always the things are accessible to those people. When they come to offices, nobody knows how to help them, they are not sure what are the things they are eligible for. So the entire administration needs to be uh, made better for vulnerable people. I would just to like to add one more thing. It is also up to voters. It can happen that somebody hijacks these topics. There might be a politician that uh, for example, will take a topic and enlarge it disproportionately. So we need to be awake as voters and to watch these people and when there is an election to show these people that we understand these topics. Thank you very much. Maybe before Anna comes back, is there somebody in the audience who has a question? about the Czech situation or maybe a question for 
one of our guests from Czechia, but I cannot see anything. So uh, there is one person in the first line who has a question. And the interpreters don't hear because there is no microphone. So, uh, regarding decentralization, do you think that there will be, people will be impacted on the economic level? Do you think that energy will be more expensive in general? And this will somehow make the impact on people more even? Uh, this is a question for Martin. My name is Philip. Thank you. First, I will tell you that I'm not an expert in economy, so I will not tell you specifically what the impact will be. But I think that we can say that period of stable energy prices is over and in the future energy sector will get decentralized and this is why our devices in the internet of things or us will look for the more advantageous opportunities there will be some consumers and some suppliers that will enter the energy into the grid and this will affect the energy prices. This is what is happening today already with the cheap and the more expensive tariff. So there will be something similar in the future going on because there will be more sources connected to the grid. So you will have to be more aware what are the opportunities that are more advantageous for you. But this is also a question of the infrastructure. The devices will be able to communicate with each other. And there is also the question of private data. And there are people that are more experienced than me who, has, who have already started dealing with that. But energy will get decentralized into smaller, more flexible, more autonomous communities. And I think that the most important point is flexibility for the future and decentralization. Miriam, there are administrative obstacles in Czechia already. For example, the law doesn't know the term energy community. It is being renovated and changed. But in the past it was difficult because the law didn't even know the word. And uh, neither vulnerable consumer is defined in the law. So there are some obstacles that make the situation more difficult. I also need to say that even on the European level, it is not so easy and we are lagging behind in implementing of the European legislation. The, legis the legislation has not, uh, is not prepared for that. We were supposed to implement the European law about energy already in 2018, uh, RED2, but we still haven't done that. I would like to uh, say that people speak about decarbonization. What is important is security and uh, decentralization. Government members of the government already speak about that. But if you look at the legislative process, is this getting faster and smoother? In general, we can see that the interest in the society is much higher. People are aware that they need to own their sources, for example, panels on their roof. So the interest exists. We hope that the legislation will get aligned faster. Now it is the period of Czech presidency in the EU. So the Czech Republic at the moment has a leading role in adopting this energy legislation. 
And Czechia is not one of the countries who is pushing for bigger ambitions. It has been changing gradually. I can see it in the discussion in society as, uh, and as well in politics. But it is still slow. Maybe Czechia should uh, raise its ambitions. We are lagging behind in renewables. The war situation showed us what were the mistakes, what were the flaws. So I hope that now we will see all of that. Just a side note, maybe it sounds like a cliché that this discussion is changing, but uh, in the case of the Czech Republic it is very important because there have been narratives that have completely deformed the thinking of the public about what has been going on in uh, the energy sector. People keep speaking about solar panels, they say that renewables are not efficient, but this is complete nonsense. For 10 years, there has been no installation of new renewable solar panels. We were able to reach a solar standard in 2020, which was due to the boom 10 years ago, but since then nothing has happened. So we are really lagging behind and the discussion has been really really distorted and it suffocated the political will. Thank you very much. Do we have any other questions from the audience? I can see that somebody's raising their hand. Hello, my name is Daniel. I have a question maybe for both of our hosts, of our guests. When we are talking about the renewables as a safer alternative as a way to deliberate us from the fossil fuels. I feel like when talking about the renewables, there are many strategic raw materials that we do not have and that we will have to import from somewhere. I'm talking, for example, about parts for solar panels or turbines. So what should we do to ensure that this won't end up as with the fossil fuels? Thank you for the question. I would like to welcome Anna back. We already started with the Q&A. We talk about the Czech context right now. But now we have Anna back. So if you have any questions for her, please go ahead. We'll be glad. But now for the response to our original question. That is a very good question. I think now it's the time to look for the answers because right now we can see that a possibility for future could be that these parts that you've mentioned could be actually produced in Europe. So the production could be moved to Europe and that would be a way for us to avoid the import whatsoever. Because when producing solar panels, we are very dependent on China, which is a big problem. So this is something to be solved on the European level. Another solution, or this solution would be that we would move the production to Europe, as I mentioned, and I think that in Europe there were already some places discovered where these uh, rare materials are stored. I know that also Ukraine has store storages of these uh, raw materials, so this would be another possible place for cooperation between Europe and Ukraine. So when it comes to solar panels, they should uh, be recycled so there should be a, basically a whole cycle of using the materials, the raw materials. I would like to add that this is always a question of price and technological progress. This is something that can definitely solve the problem to some extent, but on the other hand, we have some distribution of rare materials all over our planet, which we cannot really influence in any way. This is something to count with. And there is also uh, the issue of mobile technology, telecommunications, etc., where this question of raw materials is very burning. If something has changed already before the war, there is a change in the supply chain. And I think that a change that we will live up to see would be that the big corporates 
will focus more on the resilience of supply chains more than on the financial side of things. So right now we have companies who import from many countries all over the world and this is for them a way to change their model of operation so they are not storing up on the parts but they are changing their supply chains because they understood that if there is one blockage in the supply chain it is a major problem and it means for them that they won't get the parts in time. So a reform or a change in supply chains is definitely an important thing, although it could be quite costly. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? I'm not sure if somebody is raising a hand or not. Yes, somebody in the back, but also in the front. Okay, so first in the front, then in the back. Um, I'm sorry that I don't know much about tech uh, industry. So how much tech um, energy sector depends on fossil fuel energy in general? And uh, how do you evaluate the efforts of uh, energy transition to renewables of uh, current administration and the previous uh, administration, like, like the, the role of uh, politics in tech about this uh, energy transition? Sorry, can you maybe repeat the second part of the question? So what's the role of fossil fuels for... Uh, no, what's the role of the co uh, current tech administration? Like how much, how do you evaluate? Do you think they make enough effort to, to for the energy transition? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it's an uh, interesting question. Uh, it's, it's always better to look at this and to evaluate this in retrospect. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, if I should answer this, um, there obviously is, uh, uh, there, there are two timelines. The one timeline is a long-term um, uh, policy making implementation in the energy sector. And the, the second timeline is the immediate reaction on the crisis we're facing now. Um, uh, and also then there are levels to these timelines, the national level and the European level. So we can see that there is a, a, a quite a, um, well, unexpected activity of, uh, of many states on the EU level that's progressing uh, quite fast and, and quite well. But um, uh, I would say that uh, there's one thing that this government still has not uh, addressed and that is uh, that is the change of a mindset in terms of, of energy security. Uh, but I'm not saying that it's not going to happen or that it's not happening behind the scenes because now we are in the process of formulating of the new state energy policy. Um, uh, and obviously the state energy policy needs uh, a complete uh, update or, or um, overhaul, if you will. Uh, because the, 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 the old state energy policy uh, was based in the uh, old-fashioned th thinking of uh, an island-like production and consumption uh, of an isolated island, energy island, and that obviously needs to change. Um, so to, 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 uh, to, to sum it up, uh, there's something that's going on behind the scenes I cannot yet evaluate, um, and, but I hope, I hope it's, it's happening. And then there's this, this reaction on the crisis, which I would say on the EU level is, is quite decent. Uh, on the Czech level, it's uh, a bit more complicated. And now, and, and still, it's, it's rather too soon uh, to, to say whether it was successful or not. We'll see in a couple of months. Thank you. We have another question in the rear, if I have seen it correctly. It is difficult with the light that's shining at me. Oh, there's a there's another question. Um, is there a big uh, grassroots movement in Czech in terms of a climate uh, cha climate crisis, like the um, Sweden or Germany or? Miriam, to je možná pro vás otázka. The climate movement in Czechia is quite strong. There, is, uh, there, are, there are many organizations. In the European context, the civil society is very active. I don't remember the numbers, but all the organizations that 
address the mitigation of climate crisis, communicate, and the work is coordinated. So we always try to push together, which is more efficient than if each is uh, each organization is just for itself. And uh, regarding the public support, our colleague has mentioned Sweden and Germany and the interest of the public. Is it comparable in the Czech Republic? Regarding climate as a topic, well, it is not so popular. At the moment, the public, the, the opinion of public is uh, changing a little bit. There are people who want to ban nuclear energy and coal. We are try, trying to show a more positive line. We are not speaking just about what is wrong and what should be banned, but there is an opportunity to show a more positive examples, how to transform this, how to put this in life of uh, ordinary people. Regarding renewables, it, they have a huge support. It is about 50% of people who want the transition to happen and who want renewables. But still, the climate is seen as something that doesn't really concern people. We can see the impact in Antarctica, maybe. But uh, the opinion is slowly changing. We are working on that. Teresa, do you have a question? I would like to ask the audience, uh, does anybody want to, to, ha to ask a question? It has been happening, but uh, the room is really dark, so I cannot really see what is happening in the room. Does anybody have a question? Not yet. We still have 10 minutes, so maybe we should think of three ideas that are the most important for us. So I would like to give the floor back to Anna. Maybe it will not be a very happy conclusion, but we still need to think about this. So what are the expectations of Ukraine in winter? What do you think will happen in winter? We know about the attacks, attacks on infrastructure. I don't know the number of people that are affected by blackouts, but Ukraine is a huge country where people live in terribly harsh conditions, not only because of the military attack, but uh, also because of the infrastructure problems. So what do you think will happen in Ukraine in winter and what uh, should the European people think about? Well, uh, I think I will not say anything new here. Um, oh, oh, sorry. Frustration. But um, so I will not say anything new here. Um, but uh, and, and I cannot that I cannot really predict anything that will happen in winter. Uh, I think we saw Ukrainians uh, showing such an enormous level of um, of resilience and courage that um, they will, of course, go through this winter. And I think Europe also will go through this winter. What we have to be thinking now um, on the, uh, so for Ukraine, the most important thing remains to, to win, uh, to have uh, the outcome of this war has to be the victory. Um, so whatever happens, um, we of course have to be prepared for, you know, to have all of these generators and everything, all this uh, shorter term solutions, this is everything that the government is trying to do. And also all of the volunteers, which are plenty in Ukraine, so they are trying to support each other and support the army. But, uh, the victory is number one priority uh, for all of us. Um, because just imagine, just think of this, that Russia prevails and wins. How come, how, how would this be even possible? Uh, and, and why, you know? Uh, with all of the crimes that they committed, we, we cannot allow this to happen. Um, so we have to, I think it's important that we are thinking now already, um, so for the whole of Europe, of how we're going to also go through the uh, uh, the winter in one year. 
that we prepare well and that we prepare better policies already now. Um, Ukraine is already planning its reconstruction. So on our side, we also try to do everything to, to plan for this time for, for after the war. But for Europe to understand how it's going to be like without Russian gas, but also how to actually uh, improve the policies and to speed up uh, this energy transition we're discussing, uh, to teach quickly the professionals, uh, installers of heat pumps, of you know energy efficiency engineers and everyone, but to, to really, really speed everything up already now. This has to be happening. Um, and also one thing that I think we didn't discuss uh, today and I didn't mention, uh, we looked at, at the war from different perspectives, but it's important to understand that also it's the war that is financed by fossil fuel. Uh, Russian officials are clearly saying that all of this uh, over profit they've been getting from, from oil and gas um, that they are selling to Europe and to also around the world, they're using this to fight against Ukraine. Uh, so literally, fossil fuels are killing us already today. So if this message is not enough, you know, to be uh, responding to also climate crisis and to trying to get rid of fossil fuels, then I don't know which message could be enough. Um, so this is how everything goes into one, and I hope this is how the kind of message that maybe would leave in would would stay in in your mind as a result of our discussion of today. Um, and one last thing here from my side that I'm, I'm asking everyone um, to, to not just mention the war in Ukraine, because by, by saying this, you are not mentioning who attacked whom. It's important to say it's Russia's war. We never wanted it to happen. We are doing everything to protect ourselves, to protect our values. But it's Russia's war against Ukraine. It's Russia's war against all of you, too. This is what they are saying. This is what it is. Uh, and this is also how it's important to, to leave and to kind of everything that, that all of the policies that are implemented, they are in the wartime. Uh, we're living in the wartime. And uh, that's why we need all of these, uh, all of these changes and all of this rethinking of our economies and of, of how we consume of, of what we do already today. Thank you very much. We already said multiple times that the green transition of our climate policy is a big and important change, which will not happen overnight. There is a vision needed, there is a strategy needed, and it's never too soon to start thinking about those changes. Miriam, if you should say what this vision of transformation is for Czechia, what would you highlight? First of all, I think it should be a common vision. It should be vision of a unified society and the society and also the political representation should be active in this vision. This vision of the green future, not only for Czechia, but also for Ukraine, should have people and people's interests and the interests of the environment in its center. I think this should never give priority to financial interests. And that's why it is important to make this transformation as just as possible, as we already mentioned. The system should be just for everybody, and it also should have no impacts on our environment. So, as we already said, the war in Ukraine showed us that we are very dependent on fossil fuels, and the solution is to decrease this dependency and start saving, start decreasing our consumption, start doing with less and transfer to the renewables, of course. When we speak about the energy sector, we can see that renewables are the future. It is the solution not only for Ukraine, but the, for the whole of the Euro European Union. Thank you. And more, maybe the most difficult question for you, Martin, to conclude with, what strategy would you recommend to the Czech policymakers, to the Czech 
representatives to reach this future vision. I was thinking very hard about the three points which be our lessons to learn from these discussions, and I'm able to come up with two, basically. The first one is a change in our mindset. We should stop thinking about Czech energy sector as an isolated thing, that we will come up with sources, that we will consume it, and that we work as an isolated unit from all the others, and that we do not have to think about the others. This is not true. We need to more cooperation, more coordination, and not only in energy infrastructure, but also in the way we think. And this is a lesson to learn not only for us, but also for other countries, I think, because this mindset is very present also abroad, for example, in Germany because if they act in an isolated way, the rest of Europe will be very shocked. And I think that the coordination is really a key. We need a more complex way of thinking. And this leads me to my second point, which is the fact that energy sector is very multidisciplinary. It is associated in our geopolitical sphere, in our territory. It is connected to the politics, to the history of the country, and also to the social economic aspects. So we need to think in a more complex way. We can't be stuck in our previous mindset because this is not what we need right now. And this is the way to go, not only for the energy sector, but for all the others as well. And thanks to what Martin said, I'm very happy that also here in Yehlavia we had an option to speak about the grids, about energy sector, about sources, and about other difficult topics. Our time is running out. So I would like to thank all the participants and Anna Ackerman for her vision, for her presentation of the situation in Ukraine. Thank you, Anna. Have a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good day, too. I would like to thank Miriam Matsurova from Czech Greenpeace for her vision as for energetic and environment and also to Martin Jiruška. If you would like to contact any of the speakers, I think they would appreciate it highly and they would love to discuss the topic with you. Thank you.